So, guten Abend, sehr geehrter Herr Professor Scarantino, sehr geehrter Herr Generalsekretär Fritz, liebe Frau Kollegin nagel dotzekal sehr geehrte Gäste, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, mein Name ist Ulrike Diebold und ich bin die Vizepräsidentin der Österreichischen Akademie der Wissenschaften. Eigentlich wollte Sie der Präsident der ÖRW, Heinz Fassmann, begrüßen, aber er ist leider kurzfristig verhindert und lässt sich entschuldigen. Aber dafür habe ich jetzt die Ehre und die Freude, es im Gesamt Namen des gesamten Präsidiums zur 17. Leibniz Lecture, die dieses Jahr unter der Schirmherrschaft der österreichischen UNESCO-Kommission steht, sehr herzlich begrüßen zu dürfen. Ebenfalls sehr herzlich begrüße ich alle Gäste, die via Livestream zugeschaltet sind. Wir befinden uns hier in der vor nur einigen wenigen Monaten eröffneten neuen Bibliothek der ÖRW. Hier wurde jahrelang unter diesen herrlichen Decken Fresco Tischtennis gespielt. Nun haben wir eine öffentlich zugängliche Bibliothek mit ca. 400.000 Bänden. Noch kurz zur heutigen Lecture. Die Leibniz Lectures wurden 2019 im Rahmen der Akademievorlesungen der ÖRW organisiert. Unter dieser Dachmarke wurden die ÖRW-Vortragsreihen zusammengeführt mit dem Ziel der Einladung international hochkarätiger WissenschaftlerInnen aus unterschiedlichsten Themengebieten. Mit den Akademievorlesungen will die ÖRW die interessierte Öffentlichkeit für neueste Erkenntnisse aus der Forschung begeistern und das Bewusstsein für aktuelle wissenschaftliche und gesellschaftliche Herausforderungen schaffen und schärfen. Dieses Jahr gab es bereits zwei Akademievorlesungen und zwar eine Böhm von Bawerk Lecture des deutschen Wirtschaftswissenschaftlers Hans Werner Sinn zur neuen Inflation. Das hatte 620.000 Aufrufe auf YouTube. Sie haben eine Vorgabe heute. Und eine Hedi Lamar Lecture der Physikerin Silke Weinfurter über schwarze Löcher. Wie die meisten von Ihnen sicherlich wissen, nehmen die Leibniz Lectures der ÖRW darauf Bezug, dass Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz während seiner Tätigkeit in Wien von 1712 bis 1714 dem Kaiser erste Pläne für eine Sozietät der Wissenschaft zu Wien vorlegte. Als Vortragende werden Persönlichkeiten eingeladen, die internationale Anerkennung gefunden haben, auch über Fachgebiet hinaus. Die Leibniz Lectures finden seit 2005 jährlich statt und unser wirkliches Mitglied, Frau Hertha nagel dotzekal hat seitdem so namhafte Wissenschaftlerinnen wie etwa Sela Beni Habibib, Martha Nussbaum, Nancy Fraser, Hans Hoas, Robert Pippin, Jahel Jaiki, Miriam Bienenstock und letztes Jahr Jose Casanova dazu eingeladen. Ganz im Sinne des leibnizischen Denkens stellten all diese Vortragenden mit ihren Forschungen das Differenzierungspotenzial von Philosophie sowohl für die interdisziplinäre Verständigung als auch für die Auseinandersetzung mit öffentlich relevanten Problemstellungen der Gegenwart unter Beweis. Es freut mich sehr, dass Kollegin nagel dotzekal mit Luca Maria Scarantino abermals einen wirklich hochkarätigen Vortragenden gewinnen konnte. Sie wird ihn in, 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 etwas später kurz näher vorstellen. Und ebenso freue ich mich über die Schirmherrschaft der österreichischen UNESCO-Kommission für diese Veranstaltung. Und ich bitte nun Herrn Generalsekretär Fritz um seine Begrüßungsworte. Ihnen allen wünsche ich einen schönen Abend und einen spannenden Vortrag. Danke. Ja, sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin Diebold, Frau Professorin Dotzikal, Professor Scarantino, welcome and ich freue mich, ich denke mal, es wird im zweiten Teil dann noch zwei kurze englische Zitate geben, so werden wir das dann etwas mischen zum Vortrag, der ja glaube ich auf Englisch sein wird, wenn ich es richtig verstanden habe. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir die Schirmherrschaft hier übernehmen durften. Die Schirmherrschaften sind ja auch für uns, die österreichische UNESCO-Kommission, immer ein sehr willkommener Anlass, unsere Netzwerke, unsere Beziehungen zu erweitern, auch zu pflegen und auch bekannt zu machen oder bekannter zu machen, dass UNESCO eben nicht nur, wie manche denken, für Fragen des Welterbes zuständig ist, so stolz wir auch natürlich sind, 
auf die Bekanntheit dieser Zuständigkeit. So wichtig ist es uns eben auch, dass UNESCO die Organisation für Bildung, Wissenschaft und Kultur ist und dass wir speziell auch im Bereich Wissenschaft hier in Österreich als die offizielle Verbindungsstelle zur internationalen Organisation auch im Bereich Wissenschaft Verantwortung und Betreuung übernehmen. Konkret zum Beispiel für die UNESCO-Lehrstühle, die es in Österreich gibt, von denen es zehn gibt und wo es in Kürze dann noch zwei zusätzliche geben wird. Und dieser Hinweis auf unsere äh, zu, nicht Zuständigkeit, aber sozusagen unser Interesse am Wissenschaftssektor ist zugleich natürlich auch eine Einladung an Sie, wenn Sie mit interessanten äh, Perspektiven, interessanten Projekten zu tun haben, wo Sie glauben, Sie könnten durch UNESCO gestärkt sein oder auch für uns interessant sein, bitte zögern Sie nicht, uns zu kontaktieren. Es passt natürlich großartig, dass es heute der internationale Tag der Philosophie ist, den UNESCO seit 2005 ausgerufen hat und dessen Bedeutung die Generaldirektorin der UNESCO mit den Worten, die Philosophie ist unerlässlich, wenn es darum geht, die ethischen Grundsätze zu definieren, die die Menschheit leiten sollen. Sie sehen also die, die, die Bedeutung der Philosophie, der Bedeutung der Wissenschaft generell zeigt sich auch im UNESCO-Kontext in Ausschüssen wie dem Ausschuss für Bioethik, in der allgemeinen Erklärung über das menschliche Genom und Menschenrechte, die allgemeine Erklärung über die Ethik der künstlichen Intelligenz, Themen, die also im UNESCO-Umfeld sehr intensiv bearbeitet und behandelt werden. Und insofern selbstverständlich immer in globaler Perspektive, wie es einer Organisation mit 193 Mitgliedstaaten gebührt. Und in diesem Sinn ganz speziell, was diese globale Perspektive betrifft, sind wir sehr froh, dass Professor Scarantino uns heute mit der Philosophie in einer postnationalen Welt äh, konfrontieren, aber nicht nur konfrontieren, sondern uns darüber informieren wird. Die Generaldirektorin Azoulay äh, hat auch noch einen kurzen Text zum Tag der Philosophie veröffentlicht, mit dem ich gerne abschließen würde. Philosophy is therefore essential when it comes to defining the ethical principles that should guide humanity. As UNESCO did years ago with the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights, and more recently with the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence adopted by our 193 member states at the last general conference. In view of the magnitude of contemporary challenges, it is indeed our very conception of humanity that must be re-examined in order to reflect upon the human of the future in accordance with the theme of this year's World Philosophy Day. This reflection must be open, open to all eyes, first of all by measuring in particular in this international decade of indigenous languages how indigenous philosophies can change the way we look at the world as well as our way of living in it. Professor Scarantino, I don't, cannot foresee how your talk will relate to this claim also to the indigenous knowledge and others, but I'm sure we will immensely profit from your perspective. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for your attention. Sehr geehrte Frau Vizepräsidentin Diebold, sehr geehrter Herr Generalsekretär Fritz, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, auch diejenigen, die online teilnehmen, lieber Herr Professor Scarantino, dass wir die heutige Lecture dem UNESCO World Philosophy Day widmen können, freut uns auch im Blick darauf, dass Leibniz an der internationalen Vernetzung philosophischer sowie theologischer Diskurse höchst interessiert war. Davon zeugen etwa seine Überlegungen zur konfuzianischen Tradition, wie sie in seinem umfangreichen Briefwechsel mit den Jesuiten in China über den langen Zeitraum von 1689 bis 1714 dokumentiert sind. Leibniz entsprach damit avant la lettre, der zentralen Zielsetzung des Welttags der Philosophie. Ich darf aus der Gründungsurkunde äh, zitieren, 
a free, reasoned, and informed thinking on major issues of our time uh, zu befördern. Diesem Leitgedanken des World Philosophy Day wird unser Vortragender, das ist zu Recht schon bemerkt worden, Luca Marias Carantino in höchstem Maße gerecht. Er ist Präsident der FISP, das ist der weltweite Dachverband philosophischer Gesellschaften, der in Abständen von fünf Jahren die Weltkongresse für Philosophie veranstaltet. Da er bereits an der Organisation der Weltkongresse in Istanbul, Seoul, Athen und Beijing führend beteiligt war, verfügt er wie kaum jemand sonst über eine genaue Kenntnis der großen Diversität philosophischer Fragen, die den globalen Diskurs der Gegenwart prägen, darunter auch aktuelle Problemstellungen in Ländern, die auf gängigen Philosophie-Weltkarten kaum verzeichnet sind. Hervorgehoben sei auch, dass Professor Scarantino als Gast bzw. Honorarprofessor unter anderem in Beijing, Sendai, Nanjing und Bangkok wirkte und den Editorial Boards einer Reihe von Fachzeitschriften unter anderem in Frankreich, Indien, Usbekistan und Vietnam angehört. Mit der UNESCO war und ist Professor Scarantino durch zahlreiche Aktivitäten verbunden, insbesondere als General Editor von Diogène, Revue Internationale des Sciences Humaines. Eine spezielle Erwähnung verdient über, überdies sein Engagement im Rahmen der jährlichen internationalen Philosophie-Olympiaden seit dem Jahr 2010, ein Engagement, das ihn schon einmal nach Wien gebracht hat. Zurzeit arbeitet Professor Scarantino nicht nur an einem Buch zu Democracy in an Imperial Age, sondern auch an der Vorbereitung des 25. Weltkongresses für Philosophie, der im August 2024 in Rom stattfinden wird. Am Internet können Sie schon jetzt nähere Informationen über diesen geplanten Weltkongress in Rom finden. Dass Sie trotz der immensen Belastung der Einladung nach Wien gefolgt sind, wissen wir sehr zu schätzen. Und auch, dass Ihre Frau, die aus Thailand stammende Philosophieprofessorin Super Quarti Amataya Kul, Sie begleitet und ihrerseits eine Einladung zu einem Vortrag in Wien angenommen hat. Sie wird morgen über die Geschichte des buddhistischen Denkens von Frauen sprechen im IWK in der Berggasse. Seien Sie beide ganz herzlich begrüßt. Noch ein kleines Wort zum Ablauf. Nach der Lecture wird es Gelegenheit zur Diskussion geben, auch für diejenigen, die online teilnehmen. Also bitte uh, feel free uh, to use this opportunity. Anschließend sind dann alle Anwesenden zu informellen Gesprächen, natürlich nur die Anwesenden leider, zu informellen Gesprächen bei einem kleinen Empfang einen Stock tiefer im Erdgeschoss eingeladen. Lieber Herr Scarantino, wir sind sehr gespannt. Thank you so much for your words. I will speak in English, I'm sorry. Um, so, Professor Ulrike Diebold, Vice President for the Austrian Academy of Sciences, thank you for having said your nice word at the beginning. Dear Professor Hertha nagel dochekal dear friend Hertha, dear Secretary General of the UNESCO National Commission of Austria, Dr. Martin Fritz, dear colleagues and friends. Um, let me say at first that it is an extraordinary privilege to deliver a philosophical speech in this extremely eminent place and in this beautiful room, which I understand has been inaugurated not too long ago. So this is an additional honor. And I would like to thank you all who are here today and who are connecting online for being here. 
I would also like to express my gratitude to the Austrian Academy of Sciences for this opportunity of sharing some thoughts about current philosophical concerns with this qualified and eminent Viennese audience. It's always a pleasure to be in Vienna. In addition, it is particularly fortunate to be here on the occasion that the Day of Philosophy, that every year honors philosophy as a critical intellectual constituent of humankind. As many of you would recall, FISP, the International Federation of Philosophical Societies, has been instrumental to establishing this celebration back in 2001, when the idea of an International Day of Philosophy was proposed to UNESCO by the then president of FISP, Professor Ioanna Cucciorati. UNESCO took it up very generously. It might be a fortunate occasion, but less, much less rejoicing, and yet very meaningful for us, is the wider political context in which we, we find ourselves today. Since Professor Nagel Dosekal invited me about a year ago, something significant has changed in our world, and probably not for the better. Professor Nagel suggested that a timely focus for this lecture might be on the current state and future perspectives of philosophy on an international scale. Now, what we observe around us in Europe and beyond Europe is an intense and possibly unprecedented wave of concurrent crises, sanitary, military, political, economic, and environmental. I certainly would not be the first to say that the human condition is not always a pleasant trip. But yet, even if as children of the after war, many of us grew up in a historical bubble of relative prosperity, yet the dystopic reality in which we are being plunged day after day closely resembles to the script of one of these many popular TV series today that are all dystopic and our reality somehow joining them, almost stopping them in uh, dystopia. Now, in this context, a sensible way for philosophers to make sense is probably to help us understand the long-term transformations we are going through. A brief scrutiny of the world as it is becoming will eventually lead us to consider under what conditions philosophy could still be relevant in the world currently in the making. To some extent, much of our current concerns are not unfamiliar to us. Pandemics, wars, droughts, migrations, European societies have coexisted with these and with other similar phenomena for centuries. And a few decades of interlude have not erased them from our cultural and social memory. Even if we did not leave them, we know what these things are. In many parts of the world, on the other side, these are still daily and familiar events. Europe too, nonetheless, has widely known extreme poverty for most of its history. As literatures across our continent have extensively portrayed from, say, early picaresque novel, Lazarillo de Tormes, to Victor Hugo, monumental work, the Les Miserables. A visit to one of the most touching places in Europe, Hans Christian Andersen's childhood home in Odense, Denmark, suffices to realize how recent was the time in which Europeans would simply die of poverty through alcoholism, diseases, mental degeneration, and cold. Even with this background behind us, we sense that present geopolitical conflicts, social unrest, and growing economic inequalities are shattering critical social bonds, including public trust, to an extent that might disrupt the political and social orders we are familiar with. In the last decades, we have been witnessing an intensifying process of polarization on the world scale. We are familiar with the dreadful forms of exclusion that we observe in the suburbs of many megalopolises across the world, in rural areas, in countless slums that we see on Earth, and, if you let me mention it, in the underwater cemetery of 
migrant women, men, and children that has now become the Mediterranean Sea. So far, the Western world has largely considered itself as immune from this destiny. Yet, it might be time for us to take into account the possibility that European societies may be facing a systemic crisis that would lead us to a state of, civil, of lasting civil subalternity, political subjection, and economic servitude. This is no longer about the dissolution of a particular state or of a particular political entity. We have known that, and it's not in Vienna that they should insist on it. On the contrary, it is about the very concept of nation that is being eroded in a new global order that is increasingly dominated by an incoating directorate of what are usually called civilization states. What I mean by the concept of nation being eroded is that societies, as European societies, who slowly emerged through the Middle Ages and modernity along with the principle of national cohesion, are now facing a disaggregation of such principle of national cohesion or at least a significant loss of its relevance. Linguistic unity, national economy, borders, instruction, food, fashion, all these markers are becoming increasingly bl blurred in a world where political, economical, military, technological, and cultural powers seem to be increasingly converging towards a limited, a limited number of global players. Differences among countries are still there, of course, and they're likely to be, to be there to stay. But the ability of thinking in terms of a single culture, of one's own culture, or as we often hear, of one's identity, that ability is no longer effective in a world where ideas, languages, habits, and styles circulate across the continents and constantly merge into each other. Western societies, especially in Europe, still seem partly unaware of the inherent social and political implications of this post-national context. I am not referring here, to be clear, I am not referring here to the purported possibility of a clash among these civilization entities, as in Samuel Huntington's classic, classic claim. The, the different, and to some extent, the rival model of a competitive yet cooperative governance a political director, direct, a directoire, bringing together the most powerful entities of our world, this model seems much more realistic than the model of a clash between civilizations. The ongoing diplomatic and political stances taken in relation to the Russian crisis suggest, for instance, that such might be indeed the path that the West, China, and increasingly so the Indian world are gradually trying to take, the path of cooperation, despite some competition. It's the principle of the directoire. And to be honest, I'm not fully convinced that an imperial governance would be worse than a nationalistic and colonial one. Concerns I would like to raise are instead of a different nature. It is still unclear how compatible the ongoing reorganization of our world around political and cultural entities of imperial nature, how compatible this is with democratic citizenship as it was conceived during Western modernity. Notwithstanding its diversity, democracy is built on mindful, well-informed, and knowledgeable participation in the public sphere. It remains a process where these qualities are progressively enhanced through education, through collaborative or competitive interaction, and through public debate. Yet the nature of the public sphere, which is to some extent the natural habitat of democracy, the nature of the public sphere is dramatically changing. Unsecured and uncertain knowledge circulating through the web, a flood of fake news, the appearance of facts officially qualified as alternative, the spread of 2020 US elections denialists, the proliferation of conspiracy theories, the growing use of phrases, tones, images, and references that belong to the world of adolescents, of teenagers, 
the thousands of chat rooms, online communities, hate speeches that proliferate in the cyberspace, all these phenomena threaten not just the quality of public communication, but more fundamental, fundamentally, the organization of our societies as democracies. While phenomena akin to this have always existed, from the sophists on, the proportions they are taking today and the extent of their influence suggest that a new standard of discourse is about to take place. In particular, these indicators consistently show a steady rise of persuasive strategies successfully grounded in emotional bonds rather than in the objective analysis of facts. These emotional bonds, these emotional dynamics, seem to be inspired by the, motion, the model of the emotional communities that have dominated European societies in the pre-modern era. Their social peculiarities have been extensively studied by, Amer by American historian Barbara Rosenwein in her pioneering work on the emotional communities in the, in the early Middle Ages, a book that dates 15 years ago. They are, for philosophers and in philosophy, their archetypal figure is obviously to be found in the apparently safe social niche portrayed in Plato's Allegory of the Cave, which in its simplicity is a perfect emotional community. Is the archetypal typical figure of an emotional community. By remaining sheltered in the cave and by conforming to its rules, the prisoners bring into actual effect the ideal of one's own home, the, what the French would call the chez soi. The chez soi in which the principle has first rules and where when one can command, can reject, can expel, and can feel protected from all physical or symbolic invasions, regardless if they are real or not. Invasions of migrants, invasions of foreigners, invasions of them, as we increasingly hear in the political and public discourses, regardless of who this them would be. So this would be, this cave would be the mental and physical harbor, and I choose the word harbor, not by chance. It would be the mental and physical harbor when, where one can still hope recovering the security lost in the long process of crisis and decline of European societies. And I believe that there is no need to indulge on actual political instances of this discourse. But the question that can be raised here is who would rule a community made of prisoners confined in their own cave and who can see nothing but their own shadows. In other terms, who would run, who would rule a society where the actual consequences of choices and actions are voided by their overwhelming emotional impact and their social value lies in their capacity to produce emotional effects. It's easy to see that we are just one step away from devolving all powers to an external leader, an emotionally powerful leader who will actually take care of the security of the cave and of its prisoners. In short, a charismatic leader whose legitimacy exclusively proceeds from an emotional bond with their people, and whose legitimacy would therefore not be the least on earth affected by any other agent, including voters. This model is totally incompatible with the democratic organization of society as conceived by modern Western culture. For all the diverse forms democracy can actually take, democratic citizenship is built on the idea of free, open, and informed participation in public life, on interaction and debate, and on a permanent, steady, rational, and scientific education of all citizens, regardless of their gender, their convictions, and what are elements. There is no democracy when verbal violence, abuse, and scorn replace debate. Neither can there be democracy when public staging prevails when image, 
prevails over competence, and when competence is reduced to a shameful market of allegedly social or economic elites. But the charismatic model was also the model of Roman Principatus, the empire, and the model that informed the direct emotional bond established between the princeps, the emperor, and its people, the people of Rome. And yet Rome was a successful model of political agency, a good model of social mobility and inclusion, of scientific development, of linguistic and cultural tolerance, even of economic development. So the success of Rome as a political entity, at least during the empire, challenges our tendency to dismiss contemporary populism as a merely deceptive political doctrine. On the contrary, it calls upon the critical question whether an imperial entity is inherently populist, at least in its Western version, or whether it might admit a fully democratic social and political organization. This is an open question, of course, and I think it's the question of political philosophy today, and not only political philosophy. The ability to elaborate a suitable theoretical and political framework to confront this populist drift represent a core task of political reflection and in general of contemporary political philosophy. It is often described or referred to in terms of a conciliation of cosmopolitanism and democracy. And we may present the notion of cosmopolitan democracy as, the, as a new founding myth of, the, of a democratic ideal in a post-national world, much like Marxist ideal of a classless society or the ideal of general prosperity for classical liberalism. The steps to be taken in this direction, the direction of building a new or more effective political paradigm are as much political as they are cultural and theoretical. This also explains the growing relevance of political philosophy today and the growing place it occupies in philosophical debates. Philosophy may serve as an intellectual springboard for elaborating suitable political paradigms to make democracy compatible with a cosmopolitan order. They include informing a political context dominated by civilization states with key principles such as individual freedoms, social and racial justice, human dignity and rights, solidarity, gender equality, and environmental concerns. Influential scholars such as Nancy Fraser, whom I just learned gave a Leibniz lecture a few years ago, influential scholars such as Nancy Fraser have recently identified some of these spheres as critical concerns for contemporary political thought. She mentioned the idea of a socialism for the 21st century. However, it seems to me that a more, the comprehensive, more comprehensive political elaboration is needed to provide a consistent theoretical frame to fit these as well as other concerns of political, social, economic, ethical, and cultural nature. It's not just about addressing specific issues. It must be something more comprehensive. comprehensive. Scholars, academics, public intellectuals have therefore a major role to play in imagining the conditions and the conceptual schemes of a cosmopolitan democracy. First of all, the, conditions, the cultural conditions for a global sense of community need to be created. Solidarity, or as recently and prominently argued by Pope Francis, fraternity and sorority, are still not popular attitudes among large segments of the population who prefer to stick to the us first. And yet we should avoid blaming such attitude, the attitude of us first, on moral flaws or on lack of education or cultural sophistication. The effort that philosophers are called upon to make, along with scholars in other disciplines, this effort is to explain the deep cultural and moral roots of a stance reflecting a philosophical purview known as globalization of indifference. Sometimes the German term Gleichgültigkeit is used to indicate this, this purview. We, as philosophers, should seriously wonder 
how we have come to nurture so much anger, so much resentment as to accept as if it were normal that thousands of human beings are dying at our borders in an attempt to escape war, violence, rape, and torture. How is it possible, as it's happening, that we are seriously discussing the right of an, whether an invaded country has the right to defend itself and to defend the lives of its people? How can we leave, hun I'm talking about Ukraine, how can we leave hundreds of people who are seeking refuge, asylum, asylum or simply food, languish on a boat deck for days, as it happened again last week in Italy, under the unconcerned look of public officials? And above all, how scared must our societies, how scared must we be to let so much indifference, so much disinterest take root in our own communities. And why is this happening? This is a task for philosophers to understand. Why have we come to this point? Under the motto of being master in one's own home, concepts that are the foundations of European culture and of European civilizations, such as solidarity, fraternity, hospitality, and above all, respect for universal dignity of the human person, while well, these concepts are being happily and publicly overthrown. Phenomena of this nature do, of course, affect the fundamental values of Western civilization and transcend, by far, the daily political and electoral dynamics of our societies. It is, therefore, for philosophy to play a significant role in clarifying the roots of this uh, phenomena, but this will only ap happen under certain conditions. First, we do expect from philosophy, and we do expect from us as philosophers, not a task for someone else, we're all involved, we do expect from philosophy to develop comprehensive and historically informed critiques of the deep cultural and conceptual frames embedded in contemporary political, ethical, and scientific discourses. It's not just about observing where these discourses come from, what are the rules, what are the archetypes, what are the far away deep historical roots of the discourses we hear today. Or we go back to say they are barbarians. They are never barbarians. They have reasons that we need to clarify and we need to tackle. Second, as philosophers, we are no longer legitimated to conceive our work as ex exclusively focused on our own discipline. For philosophy to remain culturally, socially, and politically relevant, we must dismantle as much as possible the disciplinary barriers that have partly secluded our fields of investigation from other disciplines in the humanities, in the arts, from other methods of social analysis, from other forms of science, and from other forms of spirituality. Too often, philosophers only read philosophy. And probably more or worse even, too often philosophical works, even when they're academic valuable, are exclusively read by philosophers. This was not the goal of philosophy as a publicly engaged activity, not only through political action, but as an intellectual commitment inspired by a long-term vision of the models we would like our societies to be inspired by an ideal diversely yet consistently shared by as diverse philosophers as Plato, Confucius, Bacon, and Leibniz. It was time to mention him. It might be obvious to state, and it actually is obvious to state, that philosophy does not occur in a temporal or in an academic vacuum. Even the most abstract philosophy is an attempt to answer specific questions and to address the human concerns at the time, the human concerns of the time, at the deepest level of profoundness. In a nutshell, this is why to fully comprehend a specific, a specific philosophy, a knowledge of the cultural and historical context in which its core concerns were originally sensed is essential. The early Socratic dialogues, with their insistence on the logical flow and the consistent of the arguments would not be fully appreciated by us in their insightfulness unless we understand 
what the tool of rationality was intended, was meant to confront in ancient Greece as well as today. Or if we move a little bit east, Confucius' insistence on the power of rights in conjunction with virtue would probably seem restrictive and to some extent even a cultural anomaly to us unless we see the powerlessness of right without virtue, and inversely so, in the specific era that provided a context for Confucius' philosophizing. And I would like to emphasize how in both cases, Socrates and Confucius, words, discussions, exchanges of views were considered as the antidote to a rhetoric, emotional, and ultimately irrational human relationship be it through orthoepia, orthoepi, the art of mastering the right words, the right forms of expression for the Greeks, or through Confucius' emphasis on the exactness of discourse, the so-called rectification of words. The third and perhaps most fundamental task or condition for philosophy, and for Western philosophy in particular, is to take a durable cross-cultural turn that is much needed to make sense of the cultural, social, and political complexity of our world. This progressive unfastening of the philosophical canon, both disciplinary and culturally, is no novelty. That's pretty clear. In fact, it may be considered as a growing tendency in philosophical debates of the last years, and perhaps of the last decades. For years already, a growing number of scholars around the world have been increasingly attracted to themes, ideas, even styles of other philosophical traditions. Some of them are in this room. They are increasingly sensitive to diversity, whether in terms of culture, theory, of gender, or gender. Philosophy altogether, from this point of view, in the plurality of its forms and approaches and methods, Philosophy altogether seems to be in search of new conceptual tools, of new references to make sense of the complexity of the world. Yet, yet philosophers still partly find it hard to admit that Western philosophy as we know it no longer suffices to make sense of cultural dynamics that have become too complex to be deciphered through a single cultural horizon. A wider a more inclusive set of philosophical ideas and concepts is now required to make sense of the complex logics of our time and to address them. It is therefore time for our philosophical communities, for us as philosophers, to acknowledge cross-cultural inclusiveness as an irreversible orientation in contemporary philosophy to give proper value and recognition to the philosophical heritage and approaches of a plurality of human civilizations and to, and to incorporate them on a much more mundane note in, into our standard academic assignments, which is probably the most difficult thing to do. We can certainly build on a long established tradition of comparative studies mainly, although not exclusively, focused on East-West relations. And we may be naturally led to look at the extraordinary wealth and diversity of philosophical traditions in Asia. But there is no reason why the pattern, why this pattern of recognition should not apply to other conceptual, spiritual, and scientific systems across all continents. We can think of the tremendous import of Ubuntu thought in the Bantu world. We could do better justice to the philosophical subtleties of Sufism. We may recall Miguel Leon Portilla's seminal works on Nahuatl philosophy. And we can more generously, and we must probably most generously reassess the philosophical motives in the so-called oral and spiritual traditions, the indigenous traditions, that the Western canon has often casually and happily relegated to a much lower rank than philosophy itself. I would like to be very clear in this regard. I am not arguing in favor of diluting philosophy in a sort of all-embracing set of cultural studies, no. 
It seems to me, on the other hand, on the contrary, that philosophy, widely conceived as an understanding of the human mind and of human existence in their historical developments, philosophy can no longer be confined to a particular conceptual horizon. And it seems to me that we are facing a historic opportunity for reassessing the sense, the scope, and the boundaries of philosophy as a distinct, peculiar, and definite, well-definite discipline. As of today, however, it is partly still discouraging to wonder how many among our students, and also how many among us, are familiar with the work of Dasan with the work of Wang Yaming or with the work of Iqbal. Probably very few students know much if they know anything about them, and paradoxically, they're usually found in the departments of cultural studies, not philosophy. Expanding the canon and the scope of philosophy also means thinking across cultural and disciplinary delimitations, thinking across boundaries, as we are invited to do by the forthcoming 25th World Congress of Philosophy. This is an exercise that confronts us with a very sensitive reappraisal of the relations between philosophy and other forms of spirituality, of science, and of religion. Consider, for instance, the inextricable relationship between philosophy and religion in many traditions of thought, including, in part, the Western one, at least until a certain point. Consider how philosophy and religion are inseparable in Buddhist traditions and the extraordinarily philosophical insight they provide on causality, on subjectivity, and on the eschatological dimension of the human life, which incidentally forms the ground for moral feeling. It really makes little sense to reduce these and other forms of thought to spiritual expressions. A flourishing cross-cultural orientation within philosophy and within the humanities at large opens the prospect of primary importance for our scholarly work as well as for our academic communities. But we must be aware that it will not leave the contents of philosophical thought and un, un, unaffected. It will change the contents. On the one hand, we already see old philosophical notions that have been partly dismissed by modern philosophy, but have reemerged in recent debates as a result of cross-cultural cross influences. Such is, for instance, the notion of wisdom, a key concept in ancient and medieval thought, think of the notion of sapientia or the notion of in Greek, in ancient Greek of phronesis, a key concept that was progressively brushed off by Western philosophy in the course of modernity. Think of the famous writing of Kant on Swedenborg. Nonetheless, the concept of wisdom is inescapable in any attempt to establish a conceptual bridge with both Confucian and Buddhist moral thought. So are the notions, of, the notions of compassion, so dissimilar depending on the cultural context in which we find the idea of compassion. The notions of benevolence, generosity, or of the heart. We observe here how the expression widening the scope of philosophy does not exclusively refer to exploring new notions or unfamiliar notions but also to revising forms of rejected knowledge or dismissed knowledge that belong to our own tradition. On the other hand, some key orientations of Western philosophy appear hardly consistent with a cross-cultural focus in philosophy. Some of them are well known also due to their political relevance. Some, as for Tu Ming's critique of the Enlightenment, challenge the very capacity of Western reason to express a wide spectrum of human and social relations and to conceive the relation to nature in a fair and sustainable way. More technical, perhaps, but no less relevant in the realm of moral philosophy would be the difficulty to apply Kant's categorical imperative to a plurality of diversely meaningful contexts in which same situations 
might reflect profoundly diverse human relations, conditions, and meanings. In a cultural diverse context, in a plural context, in what Michael Bachtin would call a polyphony of conceptual systems, a moral imperative built on the law of reciprocity as the source of good and evil remains of bare hypothetical order. Considering that the meaning of choices and actions would vary according to the context and to the diverse agents involved individually as well as collectively or culturally. Finally, exchanges require openness. Philosophy has often described this requirement in terms of generosity, caritas, magnanimity, megalopsychia, and in recent times as vulnerability. It is indeed by making ourselves deliberately vulnerable to others' views, ideas, and beliefs that we will be able to increase our understanding of the world, expand the boundaries of our experience, and become better aware of the cultural and human complexities of our own world. Other disciplines have considerably advanced in this way. The development of a large number of studies on cross-cultural exchanges in the ancient world from the Bronze Age on have utterly, has utterly changed the limits and methods of historical research. Historians like, for instance, Philippe Bojard or David Aboulafia, among others, have not only explored the tremendous amount of exchanges that took place across the Eurasian continent and the Indian Ocean, something akin to a global trade of goods, of beliefs, myths, and most likely also ideas. Not only they did this, but by construing oceans as complex human habitats since the very early stages of human civilization, they, their work and the work of this branch of historical studies introduced new approaches and categories that are already being applied to other domains of historiography. Philosophy is to some extent now walking on the same trail although with some reluctance, with a general lack of self-confidence, and certainly with a lot, of, a lot of anxiety. Seculum philosophicum oriri. A philosophical century was about to rise, and you probably recognize the beginning of a letter written by Leibniz to Antoine Arnaud in, in 1671. It was actually the first letter of the exchanges between letter and Arnaud. Seculum philosophicum oriri. The 18th century eventually became, indeed, the century of philosophy, and a century in which the potential of philosophy as a liberating power was deployed to its extreme consequences, especially in Paris. We are now confronted with a new reconstruction of philosophy as a cross-cultural discipline. In this context, even the stale slogan of a new humanism might acquire a meaningful sense not in the sense of mimicking the historical inheritance of the Renaissance, which would be nonsensical, but as an endeavor to pursue the cultural, educational, and social conditions for a meaningful integration of different cultures and civilizations. In this culturally inclusive sense, the effort to overcome our own situatedness through mutual recognition, to jointly labor, elaborate suitable ideas, concepts, and theories for addressing common concerns might indeed justify the appellation of a new humanism. So let's, us try, to, let's try to summarize and conclude, since we have a reception downstairs. Never been comp competing with receptions. The picture that I try to draw here may look very untimely, very unzeitgemäß, to borrow famous expression by Nietzsche. Claims for philosophy to dismantle and overcome disciplinary boundaries. Claims to extend the scope of philosophy and include an undefined plurality of cultural traditions, let alone to revise the canon and scope of philosophy. All these claims seem to clash with the apparent specialization of philosophy as an academic discipline. Shall we therefore conclude that philosophy as a social and intellectual drive is not fully compatible with its scholarly effectiveness as a specialized field of studies. Shall we also conclude that only non-academic philosophy matters beyond academia? Well, things 
fortunately, are not as sharp. We do observe conflicting, conflicting trends in academic research and in academic teaching of philosophy. In several countries, large cross-cultural department, cross-disciplinary departments tend to group different disciplines together and not always on exclusively financial grounds, often, but not always. While in some areas we actually observe a tendency, an ongoing and durable tendency to specialization, think of experimental philosophy, for instance, in other fields we notice efforts to rethink critical philosophical concepts in distinctively cross-disciplinary ways. And I should probably add that the steering committee of the International Federation of Philosophical Societies includes specialists not only in philosophy, but also in religious studies, in anthropology, environmental sciences, in gender studies, in linguistics, theology, and even in engineering, which was a big thing. Um, mulling over the current debates and the perspective direction of our disciplines as Professor Nag Dojekal invited me to do here, is always a rewarding activity, even if it sounds a bit redundant in the case of philosophy. More fundamental, though, it seems to me that today, more than ever, the combination of technical knowledge and humanistic education, along with a widely cross-cultural view of human societies, is critical to ensure full freedom, full freedom of choice, full citizenship, and prosperity to the next generations. Few efforts are more urgent and more mandatory than the efforts to engage in dialogue, to cultivate a culture of compassionate co coexistence, and to be guided by generosity and curiosity in addressing each other's view, views. Here, philosophy can actually educate to citizenship in a cosmopolitan sense as a way for our children to feel comfortable interacting with people from different countries, cultures, religions, and languages, and habits. It might educate to feel at home in a larger world than their own home, or if you prefer, to consider the world as their own home. Thank you. Voilà. Well, thank you very much for, a, for an extremely timely paper. Uh, may I ask you whether you would like to raise questions? You can, of course, uh, formulate your questions in German as well as in English. If you prefer to speak in German, it's possible too. Don't expect answers in German. <laughs> for a wonderful uh, talk. I have, uh, have one, one comment and, and, and one question. The comment concerns your uh, wonderful reading of, of Plato's cave as, a, as an emotional community. I really like that. Um, and what struck me is that in that image, uh, you know, we're shackled by the neck and we can't even turn around to speak to the person next to us. So we communicate through what we see, the shadows on the, on the cave wall, which strike me awfully like what people see on their phones because, you know, nowadays even people in the same room prefer young people anyway to text each other rather than actually to talk. So <clears throat> it seems to me that that fits with one of the, one of the problems you mentioned in, in, in terms of communication and solidarity and so on. Um, the question uh, came up for me towards the end when you, you mentioned the uh, principle of reciprocity and I wasn't quite sure what your position on that was um, because it seems to me very important that um, it's one of the few uh, principles that is almost uh, universal across cultures. Uh, the golden rule or Confucius's negative version of the golden rule, uh, shoot, putting yourself in the other person's position uh, because that's something you didn't mention about um, intercultural or comparative philosophy is even the move to look at another, immerse oneself in another philosophical tradition uh, gives one a totally different perspective on one's own tradition. It's for the first time you Absolutely. see it. As Nietzsche said, you have to leave the city to see what it really looks like. 
Um, but I'm, I wonder if you could just clarify what you, want, what, what you were saying at the end there to, uh, about uh, yeah. the principle of reciprocity. Yeah. One comment on your comment. This is what philosophers do. They comment on each other. Um, the idea of these prisoners looking at an image, you're right about the, the phone, but think of a mass looking at, uh, listening at, uh, to a dictator. There, there is a, a focus. Okay? They don't look at each other. If you take the, the beautiful description of Mass in, uh, in uh, Mass and Power by Canetti, he, he, he shows very well how this interaction always goes through an identification with an external figure. So it's really about looking at one focus. And, well, I've lectured for years about that, so I could elaborate. Now, about the Golden Rule, yes, it's, I was talking about the Golden Rule. Uh, I gave, I think, five talks about the golden rule this year, so I didn't want to mention it again. The point, my point is the following. Um, in a cross-cultural uh, context, regardless of how extensive it is, of, of how wide, but in our case, it's the widest possible, at least until we, we start interacting with extraterrestrial, but so far, it's really global. Um, Rules for behavior cannot be of a substantial nature. I don't believe in the idea of a universal ethics. I think it doesn't make sense. What 20th century moral thought has done, in many cases, think of personalism, is try to find what they call a, a formal law of morality, a law that teaches us or tells us how to behave according to the different context, a law that has to be formal, no content, it's not the commandments. Um, and one of these, the possible shapes that such a, 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 a law, such a norm would take, is the golden rule. Um, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say this is the only possible. It's certainly the most popular and the most widespread across culture from the very, probably the second millennium of BC and, 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 and on. Um, and the golden rule is exactly that. It's a formal law. One of the criticisms that has be, have been made to the golden rule is, but it has no content. It's exactly, it has no content. Um, uh, Charles Morris called that uh, ascriptive formators, formal principles that form a field, that form a regional ontology, essentially. The principle of inertia is a, has no content either. Okay? You build an entire physics about that. So the formal, the golden rule is the one possible uh, forms that the, the idea of a, uh, that a, a formal law of morality can take, we can call it principle of reciprocity, of course, can call it golden rule. So I think it is what may, be, uh, may serve to establish a fair interaction about, about uh, the people who talk different languages, who have different backgrounds and so on. But I kind of hinted it in, in the comment about Kant. That's not a categorical imperative. The golden rule changes, doesn't tell you what to do. The golden rule doesn't tell you don't kill. The golden rule doesn't tell you don't steal. The golden rule, in the negative form, there is a war of religion about positive and negative forms of the golden rule. Let's assume we use the negative form. Don't do unto others what you don't want to be done by. Uh, the golden rule tells us, in any context, try to find a way to behave in a reciprocally fair way to the people you deal with. Not the immediate people, people who can be mental, who can be an abstract, who can go on for, with projections in the future. But anyway, the idea is to have a, a, reciprocal, a reciprocally fair behavior. Doesn't tell you anything about content. According to the context, you can behave in completely different ways and be as fair. We can make many examples from daily life, we can make many examples from history, we can make all sorts of examples from our experiences in which we behave in completely different ways according to the, to the, to the context. And in each case, we, we thought it was fair. It was what was the right thing to do. And, but that's hardly compatible with Kantian ethics. And, and that's a big issue because Kant, Kant's ethics is, is, is considered as the most liberal that we have. People who belong to a critical tradition, I do belong to a critical tradition, 
in epistemology. It, it, it's, it's the most open-minded, I think. Well, I think it, it is the most open-minded tradition we, can, we could find, at least in Western philosophy. But at the same time, there is a problem with the ethics there. Uh, if I may just add one word, a good example that of uh, same attitude changing with the context that has nothing to do with moral behavior is the man who wrote the Quixote by Borges, uh, Pierre Menard. Pierre Menard, for those who are not familiar, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a short novel by, by Jorge Luis Borges, and is a, is a man called Pierre Menard who writes a book, and the book overlaps perfectly about the Don Quixote. But it's not a Don Quixote, but it's exactly the same words, from the first to the last word. But Pierre Menard meant something completely different. And so the elaboration of Borges is, look how the exact same object, the exact same set of words may mean completely different uh, things depending on the context. So that was, in my, in my view, a very, a very beautiful literary example of what it meant. I don't know if it answers your your, your, your question or not. Um, <clears throat> yes, it does uh, clarify it, because what I wanted to suggest is that we, we, that something like the golden rule or reciprocity means that you don't actually need ethics. Um, no. and, 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 you know, in trying to deal with the Chinese about human rights, uh, I think no. we get on a lot better if we don't have an ethics like Kant's with, um, with, the, uh, with the categorical imperative. You mean it's not, comp I, don't, I don't say it's incompatible with an ethics. I say it poses a problem on the, ground, on, in, on the foundation of ethics according to Kant's uh, position. But it's also an open, an open, an open debate that I think, spe especially for the, with the 300 years in, in, in 2024, will probably come up more and more in the next couple of years. How to make Kant's ethics compatible with a cross-cultural approach if it is possible to make it compatible. I'm not sure it is, but it's an open debate. Any more questions? S scared by the length of the answer. I will be much shorter, I'm sorry. Um, Andreas von Berg. Um, thank you very much for the beautiful picture that you have drawn for philosophy and, uh, and the bright um, the perspective that you have shown. Um, also, I have to admit I'm a little bit skeptical. So, when philosophers uh, are called to change the world in, instead of understanding it, mm. I'm not getting very helpful, but, but rather a little bit frightened. Um, so, usually it's not uh, a good experience. Um, the second thing I would like to ask you concerning split societies that we see in so many Western democracies, um, is this a lack of philosophy or is, is, are, are these two parties armed with philosophy up to the limits? So the question would be, uh, are we producing understanding or ideology? Uh, what do you mean about split societies? What are you referring to? Polarized. Yeah, well, the, the polarized societies. The polarized societies, yes. Internally polarized, like, like, the, like in, the, in the United States. I don't think I, I, I have a problem with the idea of philosophy changing the world. I think the no, goal of maybe philosophy. Maybe I can I'm I can sorry. just add the third. I'm one. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the last thing is concerning the uh, intercultural philosophy. Um, being a student of philosophy, I make the experience how very difficult it is to understand your own heritage. Uh, which is really a lot of work and, and you have to study for many, many years. So is it really advisable to leave this aside and run off into the world and try to understand everything else? Thank you. The first thing is that, as I was saying, I, I have a problem with the exp expression changing the world versus understanding. I think the goal of philosophers is to understand uh, things and that's already changing. Uh, Marx used a beautiful, slow, very effective slogan, but it was not much more than that. Uh, it was a call to action, but it was not a philosophical goal. Now, about polarized societies, what I try to say, I think the goal of philosophers, like all people who deal with intellectual understanding of the world, is to try to understand why there, this polarization takes place. Uh, it's, very, it, what, 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 it's very easy to denounce to affirm a sort of uh, intellectual superiority 
in, in divided societies. We are the good ones, those are the barbarians. We may even think that, but that's not a good explanation. So why do these things happen? Why do we have a government in Italy that leaves people rotting on a boat for one week? You can't say these are barbarians, that's easy. But that's not our job. Our job is where, what are the cultural, mental, and conceptual uh, ideas underlying those behaviors. And this goes f very uh, far back in history. This has to go very deep in understanding. And this is our goal. Or we say, adopt a new platonic stance and say they didn't reach enlightenment uh, yet. They, it's not like they are bad. They, haven't, they did not understand the truth yet. That's not an attitude. The auto da fe doesn't work in contemporary world. So I think that our goal is to see what are the cultural roots of the different attitudes. Okay? And this is not an easy task, but this is the task that philosopher has done. Leibniz has done it all of its, all his life. Now, about cross-cultural, you use the very problematic uh, term, our own heritage. What do you mean by own? National, local, cultural, civilization, the world? That's, uh, I, would, I, 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 I don't want to answer the question, but I would like to invite to reflect on that. What does it mean, our own heritage? Think of Leibniz. Leibniz was a, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry to mention Leibniz in this place. I'm, I will certainly say something inappropriate, but Leibniz was at the same time a, one of the founders of a German philosophy, even if he wrote in French and his German was not that good. And he was one of the creators of the European uh, philosophical world, of European civilizations. So what was his own heritage? What is the heritage that people had in the 17th century? What is the heritage that we have? Do, am I Italian? Do I mean that I, my culture was not made in Vienna, was not made in Paris, was not made in Hanover, in Leipzig? Of course it was made everywhere in all these places. Now, children today have live in a world, visual world, uh, cultural world that is made in Seoul, that is made in Tokyo, that is made in uh, Singapore, that is made in Buenos Aires, that is made in Los Angeles, and in other European countries. So the notion of our own heritage changes in the course of time, and it's always very difficult to define what is our own. Now, two final uh, conclusions. The first is that the idea of own heritage, own world, changes in the course of life. We spend our life expanding our own uh, uh, inheritance. Heritage, um, or at least we should. And the other one is a question that was raised by a Chinese student a few years ago that goes in your direction, and she told me, look, I was lecturing in, uh, in, uh, in Shanghai at Fudan University, and she told me, look, professor, I tried really hard to understand the notion of substance in Western philosophy, but I can't understand what it means. Can you help me understand it? So I kind of gave her some reference, and she stopped me and said, no, 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 I write all of that. I don't need references. Just I do not understand what it means. And that was a good example of And so the only thing I told her is, look, get a fellowship, go spend a year in Europe or two years, and try to absorb the notion of substance through absorbing behaviors, because this is how we expand our boundaries. Some things come into our understanding by leaving them, not by intellectually studying them. So these are two final uh, remarks to, to, to what you say. But I think that this is what we, are, we have to do. Just go around and try to expand the boundaries, which is an expression by C.I. Lewis, uh, try to expand the boundaries of our experience as much as we can all lifelong. We all start from, we all have a starting point, of course, you're right. I don't know if it... Do we have any questions from the online? Oh. No, thank you. So I can give my fourth lecture for... <laughs> I just have a short question because I think it's a very urgent uh, task of, of philosophy today uh, to make it possible to live uh, out of... Uh, to live... Uh, 
in a more peaceful way with other living pe pe uh, beings and overcome anthropocentrism. And, and my question in this respect is uh, if we receive, uh, if we know that as a, po uh, a task of post-national uh, philosophy, uh, if how can we, uh, how can this be possible uh, without uh, Minuating human rights and, and anthropological uh, tradition and all these things. We, we, I think we, we need that in a more serious form than the traditions we have from indigenous people. We have also new science and so it's very difficult. The best attitude is probably to learn from a plurality of traditions. You mentioned indigenous people. There's a wealth of richness, not in terms of, of, of material, not all, also, but not only in terms of, but in terms of knowledge that we are not fully aware of. And sometimes, even when we are aware of, we kind of misunderstand that. The history, you mentioned anthropology, which is a beautiful discipline invented by a philosopher, by the way, because Levi-Strauss was a philosopher, but anthropology has misunderstood a lot of things in, in the past. And much of the work the good work I think anthropology did is try to improve its way of understanding other, other people. So this is something that, again, no discipline can do by itself. We have to try to read other things other than our, look, if, I was visiting a friend at home a few days ago and an old friend, philosopher, and he only had books of philosophy in his library. So I said, where are the other books? He said, what other books? I don't have other books. I read all of these. But it was only philosophy. I think that the, the idea of going a little bit in the direction of a wider outlook, as it was in the past, I don't want to be passatist. Okay? I don't want to say, let's go back to the good old times. No. But a little bit of better understanding of the human in its different uh, expressions and a little bit more of being in touch with each other. It's something that is uh, very important. This is why I'm so worried about the effects of the pandemic. People stay behind the screen. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing to come and attend a, a, a meeting and meet other people at the other end of the world than stay at home behind the screen and listen to, to a talk. The talk is maybe good, maybe bad, okay. But what really matters is the human contact that, that you made. And this is a problem that we've seen, especially with students. How many students today, I think the rate is 70% to 30%. How many in America, how many students prefer to stay at home instead of attending courses at university? But that's not the same thing. That's not the same quality. They don't learn the same things. They don't live the same experience. So this is something that, in my view, may not sound philosophical, but it's very important. Yeah, my question relates directly to it because you were quite clear in, in saying you do not want to dilute your discipline into some kind of you know, general <laughs> cultural studies. But on the other hand, relating to, to what you just uh, said, what's, what's the institutional form of your idea, you know, since here this is the Academy of Science, you are at universities. Uh, so what is the, the framework? Is it still the Institute of Philosophy? Is it the university as we know it or as you knew it? So Do you have a, is there a, a model? So far it's still university. I hate to say this, but uh, I'm not sure university is still the best place for this, but it's probably the only one. It's like democracy. It may not the best, but uh, may not perfect, but it's the best. Um, look, when you teach history of philosophy, a very classic discipline, academic discipline, okay? You have a course, can be, history, let's say, history of medieval philosophy, modern philosophy, ancient, whatever. Uh, in most European universities, and probably American university too, this means Western university. Western philosophy. We had now in Italy a revision of the ministerial, uh, by the Ministry of, of uh, University, a revision of the contents of the different sectors. 
history of philosophy, moral philosophy, theoretical philosophy of science, and so on, about a dozen of these macro sectors. So extremely academic, administrative, and, 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 and philosophers had to provide a description of the contents of their thing, like in the history of ancient, ancient philosophy, we describe the history of Greek and Roman levels. All of them were uh, assumed that philosophy is a Western thing. It was despairing. And including history of ancient philosophy, it was clearly mentioned Greek and Roman heritage. You can change that in the contents without changing the institutional frame. It is true that the, especially in Europe, probably mostly in Europe, the institutional uh, organization of university is made by sectors. France is spectacular from this point of view. Italy is very, I'm not sure about Austria, but Italy, France are very, very uh, secluded in their, so that's a hindrance. But I think it can, it can be overcome by, by changing the sector. I can, I'm not a specialist of Chinese philosophy at all, but I know that if I drop to students the idea that part of the moral thought comes from China, maybe some of them will start being interested and become a real good, a knowledgeable specialist in Chinese philosophy or other things. So this is, doesn't require much administrative change. It requires a change of, uh, of, 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 of will. Now, if you ask me, is, 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 is it, would it be possible to imagine something better university? Probably yes, but it does not exist so far. I would like to, uh, to raise a question and, a footnote, and to, to add a footnote. But I would like to begin with a footnote. Uh, the Kantians in the room shook their heads know, you know. Uh, when you uh, dis described universalism. And I just wanted to make sure that it is clear that the golden rule is not identical with Kant's categorical imperative. Oh, absolutely. So that I wanted to make sure. And then the, the second is that the categorical imperative is not just formal without having any content, but the one content is the the dignity of each and every person. And, and that is, a, is, is, the, is the basis for the very, for the very demand. Uh, let us listen to people in other cultures, in other philosophical traditions and so It means taking seriously everybody as a person. So the categorical imperative in my mind is not empty and abstract. Uh, but this was the f this was just a footnote uh, relating to to the to the shaking heads <laughs> in the in the in the middle on the left. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you is, with reference to the first segment of your talk, when you spoke about cosmopolitan citizenship. This is a very interesting topic and a very timely topic, I think. But what exactly can we do with this concept? Is it, is it only relating to, uh, to scientific? Of course, in si any kind of research has to have a global interchange in order not to, uh, not to miss the most advanced uh, research results. But as far as, as you say, citizenship, a cosmopolitan citizenship, isn't there, isn't there a clash with the fact that everybody is still being a citizen of a certain state. And what's the relation between global citizenship and the, and the, and the real states of which, we all, of which we all still are citizens? What's, what's that relation? Thank you. A, a, a comment on the footnote. First of all, I apologize if I gave the impression that I thought that the category imperative overlaps with the golden rule. It's the contrary. And I, the footnote is that I remember that we had uh, this discussion at, in Songchan a few years exactly on this exact topic. And they said, there might be an, an inconsistency there. And you say, no, but it's not true. Um, now, about cosmopolitan citizenship. This is a topic that has been discussed uh, pretty much in Italy by Daniel Archibuj and other group, groups in Rome are kind of working together about this. The idea is that cosmo cosmopolitanism has been considered in, uh, in um, has a very positive connotation. We think of someone as cosmopolitan as someone who's open-minded, who's not closed into a closed identity and so on. But 
the idea of cosmopolitanism is very much connected to, to the idea of a supranational political power. It's very much connected to the idea of empire. And, and that raises a question because we don't know how, we, we, it's not clear yet, I think, to anybody how this is compatible with the democratic organization of, of society. If you think of people who are cosmopolitan, you are essentially distinguished between those who have the means to become cosmopolitan, to study, to travel the world, and those who do not have the means and do not have access to an education that allows for that to happen. So there is a first problem which is of social nature, but then there is a more theoretical problem which is how do you um, how do you join the idea of a non-national citizenship, much wider than a national citizenship, feeling uh, citizen of the world was the old expression. How do you fit in within a democratic organization of the society in which you are supposed to live? So there is a clash, as you said, uh, and essentially people who think as I do, that a cosmopolitan approach, a cosmopolitan lifestyle, way of style, is something that we are going through. And it's the only way to escape subjugation. At the same time, we see a problem in the connection with democracy. And we don't know exactly how to fit the two things in. So the notion of cosmopolitanism, as a cosmopolitan citizenship, has become much less positive than it used to be by a close scrutiny. Uh, but it's, it's a work that is still very much ongoing, so I don't have an answer about that. And I think we see it in, in real life when we have all these uh, political attacks on the elites, on, 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 globe, on international entities, on international uh, powers. This is very much an attack on cosmopolitan ways of, of cosmopolitan forces, and it's very much justified from a certain point of view. So there is a, a, a clash there that I, is being studied. Um, the center for this is the uh, National Center of Resor uh, Scientific Research in Rome. They are doing a very good work on that. We hope to produce some substantial work soon enough, but not yet. I think one last question, did I see the, the last, yeah, please, and then we can continue discussion downstairs, please, go ahead. Uh, well, my question has luckily been partially answered right now, um, however, I would like to deepen the discussion a bit. Um, you mentioned the term empire sometime, uh, sometimes during your uh, lecture. You also um, said that the uh, nationalist world is in demise. And, well, I don't think that a, uh, the demise of this nationalist world necessarily means that cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism is going to take the place of the nations. Uh, and while you briefly touched on this term of empire, I would just like to ask you, uh, what options you see in for for the future evolution of citizenship, for example, of statehood, that's as opposed to nationalism. That's a good question, and if I had an if I had an answer, I'd probably be at United Na at United Nations. Uh, I don't like to use the term empire because it's been a bit overused and it's kind of laden with a lot of rhetorical connotations. Civilization states is also a an alternative term. Um, think of one of the main features of, of, of a nation, the borders. The borders are not only a physical uh, border. They are fiscal, economic, linguistic, and so on. These things are being shattered by today's world. We have an enormous problem with uh, major global economic entities who do not pay taxes in the countries they work in because they don't have a, 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 national, a national basis. Think of all the, all the web-based uh, entities like Metaverse or whatever they're called now. 
Um, we have financial movement that escape borders. We have multilingualism that is in, be, been diffused beyond a formal recognition. People in, in, in different countries speak different languages, even if these languages do not belong to their, to their country. Uh, the United States has, I think, only English or English or Spanish as, as official uh, language, I don't know. But when you go renew your license, driving license in the United States, you can do it in, I think, 23 different languages. Uh, so there are many examples of the fact that the idea of nations, as we have conceived it, is... Um, is kind of in trouble in a world that works in a way that is not fully compatible with that. But then there is another level which is more problematic, is the level of the people, the folk. If you take a, probably one of the most smart, clever political philosopher in the century, Schmidt, who was a horrible fascist, we can say it, but had a very clear understanding of where the world was going. He didn't like it, okay? But he had a very clear understanding of the world. His, all, his entire problem is, what do we do with a world in which the folk, as I knew it, is no longer a valid actor of public life, a valid actor of international lives? His entire world, from the studies on earth and, and sea, the studies on, on resistance, they're all about that. And that's the basis of the nation as well. So where are we going in a world that is no longer based on the a, a, a national identity, on the on identity of a people, but is based on a set of values, in a, on a set of missions, on a set of uh, justifications for behaving that do not belong to the identity of a people. I don't know if it's clear, it's um, probably not, but uh, let's put it this way. Um, the idea, Marcel Detienne called the idea of national identity a riddle, okay? It's a very famous book, L'identité nationale, une énigme. Um, but what we see today are more and more, for the first time probably since the fall of Rome, uh, major political entities that do not consider themselves as bringing a clear national identity. That consider themselves an invested of a mission. Think of Rome. Hmm? I give you an empire and this empire will have no end. No limits, that's the Enaides, no? Uh, uh, I'm not giving you a land. I'm not giving you a promised land. I'm not giving you borders. I'm not giving you this. I'll give you the capacity of expanding the, the borders of your domain with no limits. That's not something that European nations have ever conceived. European nations had colonies, but that's a different thing. European nations work in a different way. Now, the world in which we are today does not work that way anymore. It may, it's made by increasingly universal forces, economic powers, military powers, technological powers, and more and more cultural powers. What identity do you want to look when teenagers go from a Korean TV series to American ones, to Japanese, to whatever. They, they don't have this. They live in a different world, which is no longer the world of nation. So what does it mean for, uh, for societies that, organize, that are organized as nations? This is a problem. I don't know what it means. I don't know where we are going. I don't know what it means. I see what it means for Russians. That's pretty obvious. What does it mean for nations? who will be in trouble in a world that is no longer run by nations? This is, not a, this is a, a question for futurologists, but I think that it's worth being observing where this, uh, this, this process is going. I think it's worth understanding that we are not just of seeing a war in Ukraine, that we are not just seeing 
uh, what is um, Facebook that does not pay taxes in, 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 in Austria. Because, but we are seeing something that is much deeper. We are seeing a, a, a structure of, of different human activities that is no longer, uh, does no longer fit into a national scale, into a national scale, into a national corps. And that's something that is probably utterly changing our world. And in for philosophy, is much more, uh, very much the same. Look all of the critics to the um, exclusive character of uh, Western philosophy, all the post-colonial studies and all these critics. They are, in my view, too harsh, but there is a point there. There is a real critique that has to be taken into account. So how do you evolve? How do you change your way of doing philosophy in a, in a way that makes it fit for a much wider world that we have seen and for a world that is no longer based on I am German, I'm French, I'm British, I'm Italian, whatever, but to a world where people say this is what I'm going to do, not this is who I am. Okay? Think of Rome, study the, the history of Rome, that's a wonderful example and it's the only time in Western history where you had a truly universal power ruling, and successfully so. And you see a lot of elements that might be useful to understand and to decipher today's uh, political relations. No, a very, very challenging, interesting <laughs> final remark. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture and for the answers. <laughs>